a century of covert action skirmishes and counter skirmishes on the Afghanistan border of what was then India that their so-called great game was getting nowhere. They decided that there was really no way that white Western influence or even white Slavic influence was going to play any role in the Pushtun tribes in this area who had been living even in kind of a pre-Islamic uh, type of society for a very long time and were not going to be influenced at all by the machinations of colonialism that were going on in the late teen, 1800s when the great game was taking place. So they wiped their hands of the affair and said, we're getting out of here. Now, 20 years ago, Mikhail Gorbachev came to the same belated recognition after 10 years of watching the Soviet army ground down in Afghanistan. Now, admittedly, Gorbachev faced something that uh, nobody had to face 100 years ago, a CIA war that was considered the good war compared to the Nicaraguan Contra War, the Charlie Wilson's War, in which anywhere between three and five billion dollars a year was poured into the Mujahideen in Afghanistan so that advanced weapons like Stinger missiles could get into the hands of the kind of people that later formed the core of Al-Qaeda. It was a ruthless, ruthless aftermath to the Soviet invasion after Soviet troops left and the various Pushtun tribes of the Northern Alliance started battling for control of Kabul and everything was reduced to rubble until an even more purist organization, the Taliban, came into town to clean up the bad guys and form their own bad guys. Iraq. In this case, of course, there was no Afghanistan Air Force. There was no Afghanistan Army. There was only a rudimentary Taliban structure in the cities that uh, Donald Rumsfeld once said didn't even really amount to a war, just a little exercise for our troops. So it was a relative six-week pushover for U.S. to establish control along the Kabul-Kandahar corridor, the same corridor that the Soviet troops had to rely on during the course of the 1980s, because the only time Najibullah the, the Soviet-backed uh, person in Afghanistan had any real control was within this semi-urban corridor. Once you left there, it was all dependent on the Pushtun tribes. Similarly, the United States discovered six years ago this week in the caves of Tora Bora that once you get out of that Kabul-Kandahar corridor, there is no Western white influence to be had, whether it's colonialist, imperialist, what you may say, everything turns into a ground down nightmare. As a result of that, George Bush suddenly jumped up and said, hey, wait a minute, here's a bad guy, look over here, his name's Saddam Hussein. And suddenly, all the troops, all the media, all the attention went to a nation that was not at that point doing any kind of attacking or threatening of the U.S. or its neighbors. This was the ultimate diversionary tactic. And sure enough, everybody went straight to Iraq. Meanwhile, the conditions in Afghanistan just continued to fester. Hamid Karzai could gain no control outside of the Kabul-Kandahar corridor, primarily because the military in Pakistan, and particularly its inter-services intelligence agency, continued to fund the Taliban in the border regions, continued to fund groups like Lakshari Taiba that were responsible for actions like last November's attacks in Mumbai or the recent attacks on the Sri Lankan cricket team. Brought to you courtesy of the Pakistan government. Efforts to make things quote unquote better. And I use that term, of course, with a lot of trepidation. We did see Musharraf leave in Pakistan. Unfortunately, Benazir Bhutto's widower, uh, the man known as Mr. 10% for the last 15 years because of the degree of corruption in his party, has now all but outlawed any supporters of Nawaz Sharif, the uh, alternative party, or a satellite dish. I'm not very happy with that situation. And I'm sure that Barack Obama is not either. But what are his choices? 
One choice that has been made in a de facto way recently, of course, is that Obama is continuing the regular use of Hellfire missiles launched by Predator UAV drones in robot flights across the Swat Valley, across Waziristan. Nothing has changed from the Bush administration to the Obama administration. In fact, Leon Panetta, the current CIA director, told journalists a couple weeks ago that he thought the Hellfire missile attacks were astonishingly successful, and he was hoping to see more. I was looking on the internet this morning, and I saw the mother looking at this little girl, Jawahir Jewels. She must be about four or five. And the, the look in the mother's eyes as she looked at this little Jawahir, I just thought, you know, if everyone could see the picture of that mother, we would have this whole quad full of people. Before the modern state of Israel was created in 1948, a long time before, my parents were born in the land of Palestine. My dad was born in Jerusalem, an ancient land, a holy land, holy to Jews, Christians, and Muslims. He has very good memories of growing up with Jews and Muslims who are his friends. My mother was born in the land, in, in the city of Jaffa. Jaffa is called the Bride of the Sea because it was right near the warm Mediterranean. And she has good memories of swimming in the sea and eating oranges by the crateful. They had orange orchards in the back of their home. And she said they had to store the oranges under their beds, which would make their rooms smell of springtime the whole time. Later on, when we were living in England, she would go into the store and look to buy oranges and see the, la the label, the Jaffa labels, and get very upset and walk out. Emmanuel's father, Benjamin, was part of the Irgun terrorist gang in the 1940s that killed Palestinians. That doesn't come out very often in the news, and I bet a lot of you here didn't know that. We were cautiously encouraged when Hillary Clinton went to Jerusalem and said that home demolitions in East Jerusalem were not helpful. That's an understatement. That sounds like a British person. <laughs> but then right away she went to Jerusalem and visited the Holocaust Memorial for the souls that had been lost 60 years ago. Do the 400 little children in Gaza not count? We were horrified when we saw images of children in Gaza, children who looked like our children, dying as the whole world stood by in silence. After the carnage is over and we were catching our breath, the media keeps repeating Israel has every right, every right to defend itself. We never hear about Palestinian rights, do we? We only hear about rockets, but we don't hear about it in, constant, in, in the context of an occupation. After the carnage in Gaza was over, the media repeats that they have a right. But do they have a right by using F-16s? and white phosphorus on a defenseless and caged population. People talk is because I want to read to you this email that I received. It's about an, it, an event that took place in the town of Beit Umar. Beit Umar is a farming town south of Bethlehem. Bill and I have worked there helping farmers to harvest their grapes and their plums because when they do so, they are stoned and shot at by Israeli settlers. These are Israeli civilians living in, uh, in the uh, in settlement, illegal settlements in the occupied territory. And when the farmers who are in their own fields trying to harvest their own crops, they are attacked by the settlers. So it, it takes international, identifiable international people as a presence among them for them to be able to do the simplest thing, which is to harvest their crops or take them to market. They began punching him in the stomach and the legs. When the PSP international presence tried to intervene in the severe beating, she was grabbed by the neck, forced to the ground, and also handcuffed, though she informed the soldiers that she was both an American and an Israeli citizen. 